Amen, amen. So good to worship the Lord together, and uh, we're so glad you're here today. Grab your Bibles and turn to 1 John chapter 5. And uh, it is Mother's Day, so I'm sure it's already been said in here, but happy Mother's Day to all the moms. We're so thankful for all the sacrifices you make, for the kiss boo-boos, for all the stuff that you've helped us through, the times you just saved us from dad. Thanks, moms, for everything that you do. We appreciate you. You're the best. We're grateful, and since we love you so much, we've planned a special liar series for you this morning. Uh, <laughs> If you're new to Eastview, if you're watching this online, you just need to understand that uh, we preach through the Word of God, and it's Mother's Day, and we're in the middle of 1 John 5, and so uh, we hope you'll join us. And actually, it's not a bad place to start uh, talking to your moms and, about moms and talking about lying, because we have to admit, all of us here have probably told a fib or two to our moms before, and we've had to confess uh, to her our sins and so I thought it'd be appropriate today to share a story from my childhood that's a famous mom lie story in our family the mom's told many times when I was three or four years old that apparently this took place apparently it had been a very uh, particularly windy season and I had picked up on that as a little kid you know little kids pick things up like that and it had been very windy in fact all the adults around and our church were talking about it mom and dad were talking about it and so uh, the, you know obviously they weren't from central Illinois because it's not, it's not news that it's windy, all right? It's always windy, but apparently there, everyone was talking about how windy it had been, and so this is ingrained in my mind. At the same time, my mom isn't trying to instill in me, like many moms, that boys shouldn't go pee outside, okay? <laughs> and uh, she's trying to teach me this lesson, which is an impossible lesson to teach to a boy or a man of any age, actually. It's one of the great gifts that God's given us. We can go to the bathroom outside, okay? But I digress. <laughs> Apparently one summer day, I had gone to the bathroom outside, but I couldn't quite get my pants back up right. And you've ever seen a kid pull his pants up and get them all twisted and tangled in the underwear? And so I got this hopelessly twisted mess with my shorts and, uh, you know, kind of half, you know, mid-thigh. I've got a situation. It's not good, right? And uh, the problem is when you're four years old, there's not a whole lot of problem-solving skills. So I had no other choice, I had to go tell mom. And so I walk in the house, mom, can you help me pull my pants up right? And uh, to which she replies, Michael, Robert, how did your pants get down in the first place? To which I replied, the wind blew them down, mommy. <laughs> so that's my Mother's Day confession, mom. It wasn't the wind, it wasn't the wind. I feel so much better now, I'm clean before God. And now we can get into 1 John chapter 5. Believe it or not, that stupid story has to do with our text today. So um, let's read 1 John chapter 1, starting with verse 5. This is the message we have heard from him and we proclaim to you, that God is light. In him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and his word is not in us. Let's pray and ask the Lord if he'll speak to us on this Mother's Day. God, I thank you that you've brought everybody here today on this beautiful day. Praise you for the creation. Praise you for the birds singing and the trees and the sunshine and the blue skies. And thank you for our moms. Thank you for this day. And you know I've been praying all week, God. I know that this can be just another event on Mother's Day before lunch or brunch. And I don't want it to be that. I want it to be a life-changing experience. I know there are people here who are just here because their mom asked them to come to church with them today, and so I pray that you would awaken their soul to what we're getting ready to talk about. And I pray that those of us who have been in church our, our whole lives, long time, that you would awaken our soul to the reality of fellowshipping with you and fellowshipping with one another and confessing our sins. So God, you have to do this work in thousands of people's lives. I'm just going to talk. I'm going to lift up your son, Jesus, and I pray that your Holy Spirit will come in power and move in each of our hearts. Change us, God, so we walk away the day forever different because of who you are and how you've loved us. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 
Well, if you've not been here all the way through our series, let me just kind of recap it for you. We started three weeks ago by saying Satan is the liar. He's the one that has all the lies. He's the father of everything false and deceptive and not true in our lives. And the world's picked up on that message. And we talked last week, Satan starts all the lies. And then this world picks up on this lie that says, Jesus is not the Christ. That's the lie. But today we come to a liar that's most surprising of all. In fact, I think it's the person that lies to us most about who we are and about what we are. And the liar is us. We find ourselves lying to ourselves about this thing called sin more than anything else. And so today I want us to deal with us as liars. By the way, again, happy Mother's Day. Yeah, I just want to make sure you know that I'm aware that it's Mother's Day. But today, John says it's possible for us to have such deception in ourselves that we miss the whole point. That we deceive ourselves into thinking that we're okay that we deceive ourselves with this thing called sin. And there's three main lies that we tell when it comes to sin. And John introduces them in this passage. I don't know if you picked up on this, but as I'm reading, I keep saying, if we, if we, if we, if we. There are three if we statements that are basically lies that we're good at telling to ourselves about sin. And so today we're gonna deal with these, these three lies that in the first century were being told publicly. Oh, you guys are fine. You don't have any sins. There's nothing wrong with you. And now 21 cent- or 20 centuries later in the 21st century, still the lie in the culture says, you're fine. There's nothing wrong with you. Participation trophy, even in spirituality, you're okay. But the truth is, that's part of the lie that we weave into ourselves when we tell ourselves lies. The first lie is this one, verse 6. If we say that we have fellowship with him while we walk, walk in darkness... We're lying. We, we, we can't fellowship with God. This word fellowship means to, to be in partnership, to hang out with God, to love God, to be friends with God, to be besties with God, BFF with God, whatever it is, that you and I are in relationship with God. And if we walk in the darkness to say that we have fellowship with God who is in the light, we've got a problem. We're talking about sin here, and I just want to draw some simple things up here on the, the, because I'm simple anyway, that's all I can draw, but some simple things up here to help us understand this message today. God, in that very first verse we read, it said God is light. In him there's no darkness. Never sinned, never thought a bad idea, never thought of something selfish, never thought of something that would hurt somebody. He's always doing right. He lives in the perfection of light. And so that means that everything that God does is perfect. That's the target for perfection and light. We're gonna talk about this thing today that many people don't like to say anymore because it's so harsh, it might make us feel guilty, it might make us feel bad about ourselves. In fact, some churches don't even use this word anymore, the word we're gonna see in this passage. We say things like we've made a mistake, there's been a misstep, we made a misjudgment, but here's the Bible word. We call Bible words by Bible, th- uh, Bible names, things by Bible names, here it is sins you know what that literally means the reason I'm using this is because it illustrates perfectly what we're talking about today if God is the target this word sin and I don't want it to be plural even though we do have plural uh, this word sin literally is the Greek word hamartia it means to miss the mark so anything that doesn't fall in the bullseye of God's protection or perfection is darkness is sin We've missed. He has these standards for us all of our life. Everything that we do, every part that we live, all the words that we say, every relationship that we're in, every resource we've been given, God has things that he wants us to follow, the perfect mark for our lives. By the way, if you're worried about God being imperfect, there's always three, there's three P words you can always think about God's perfection. He makes all the rules for our protection, for our provision, and to show us the person of God. Protection, provision, person. That's why he has rules. He's doing it for our own good. He wants to keep us from bad things happening, and he wants to introduce who he is. He's the target. Anything outside of the target of God, we call it sin. And now here's the deal, because you and I can get very, very comfortable with our sins and even begin to justify our sins and even begin to say, you know what, I've got fellowship with God even though I'm walking in the darkness a little bit. We do it with this little phrase, and I know you've used it. I've used it a million times. Nobody's perfect. Nobody's perfect, right? 
And so that justifies a whole bunch of things that we do. It's a danger for some of us who are older Christians because as we get older, we go, you know what? That's just a habit I've had for 20 years. I just can't control that thing. I just, I've just grown comfortable with this sin. And, and the problem is, is that as we become comfortable in our sin, it keeps us from walking and having fellowship with the light. Right? Some, sometimes older Christians, and by older, I just mean older in your faith. You've been a Christian for 10, 15, 20 years, and they come to me and say, man, God just doesn't seem very close to me. Or it doesn't seem like my prayers are being answered the way that they used to. Or I can't feel the Holy Spirit's power in me. And I can only confess to you the times in my life where God seems far He doesn't seem to be there in times of trouble when the Holy Spirit doesn't really seem to be moving powerful in my life are those times when I'm just letting little sins carry on. And by the way, there's no such thing as a little sin. It makes me feel better to say that, that they're just little ones. Younger Christians, you live in a culture, and especially if you're in your 20s or 30s here, you've grown up in a culture who wants you to understand that you're okay and everything's fine and Jesus loves you, this we know. And that's true. But Jesus also has requirements for you. He also wants you to follow his ways. You cannot take the love of Jesus Christ without taking all of his commands. Jesus says, I have commands. And by the way, the world's lying to you. The world says, no, he doesn't, Jesus doesn't talk about these things. Jesus talks about everything. He talks about your money. He talks about your sexuality. He talks about your loving. He talks about your friendships. He talks about your home. He talks about how you seek pleasure. He talks about your future. He talks about your past. Jesus talks about everything. Everything. And the truth is, we don't want to hear the things that he tells us not to do. We think we can be friends with Jesus and not care about everything we we do that's offensive to him. Now, if you're not a follower here today, uh, if, you, if you came here today and maybe your mom said, come to church with me on Mother's Day, can I just talk to you for just a moment? If you're not a follower of Jesus, you maybe don't even believe anything I've said so far, uh, you're going to have to do something with the evil of this world. There's something wrong with this world, something messed up about it. And you've got you to either identify it as sin, and then you've got to identify something as good and something as bad, and then you've got to decide what's the answer here. And my prayer and our prayer as a church is that today is the day that you come and say, yep, that's me, I'm a sinner. Because that's the beginning of being saved. And so that's our prayer. We're not going to hide it from you. We're not going to sneak up behind you and go, boom, you're saved. That's what we're here to do, okay? Just full disclosure. So that's the first sin. If we say that we, that we have fellowship with the Father, but we walk in darkness, that's not true. We're deceiving ourselves. The second one is found in verse 8. The second lie about sin, we convince ourselves that we don't really sin. We just deceive ourselves. See what it says? Verse 8, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Now, most of us in here would not be so bold as to say they don't have any sin. If I sit down with most of you in a room, one on one, I say, hey, just, let's just be honest. You sin, right? Yes. And you can probably name a few of them, okay? But the truth is, is that it, this, this denying that we have sin in our life happens in a way, in a few ways that I think are subtle, but they happen in the church all the time. Number one is we justify our sin. We say things like, well, everybody else is talking like this. Everybody else uses this kind of language. I'm just fitting in. It's not that big of a deal. We say things like, well, the sex life in my marriage right now is not that good, so a little lust, it, you know, it's just understandable. Or we say, you know what, I had to gossip all the sort of details about this person so you would get the prayer request right. Right? We have ways, man. We can justify the wrong things we do in our life to make them look good, and we even begin. And here's what John is getting at. Sometimes we tell these justifications so much that we actually believe them. We're lying to ourselves. We're good people. We don't have sins. The other thing beyond justifying is we minimize them. Yeah, I flirted a little bit at the office, but I didn't really cheat on my spouse. Yeah, it's really not stealing because they know that They have extras. Everybody's going to take these. Yeah, I I drank a little bit too much, but I didn't get drunk. You see, we minimize. We take all the sins and the problems that we have, we just kind of take them down to a lower level. They're not that bad. Yeah, it's a lie, but it's a little white lie. See how, how dangerous that is to begin to minimize what's going on. Or, finally, we compare ourselves. This is the easiest way for Christians to be okay with our sin. We just compare ourselves to other sinners. You can always find somebody worse than you. Even if you have to go to Hitler or something, you can find somebody worse than you, 
Right? We can always find people that are, we're better than, that we follow better. We can look around in the church and we go, well, at least I didn't do this. At least I didn't have that happen. At least I'm following better than that. And we begin to justify and minimize and compare to the point where we really believe that we don't have any sin. We become comfortable. We say to ourselves, I'm not that bad. Listen, here's a quick test that you can take. We'll all take it together. I'll give you five seconds. I just want a quick, a quick response. Quickly, name the sins you struggle with. One, two, three. Four, five. Now, if you couldn't think of any, you're either Jesus, <laughs> I'd like to see you as soon as church is over, or you're not being honest with yourself. You see, the truth is all of us have sinned, and it's not that we're all so bad. It's that God is so good. He is light, and in him there is no darkness, verse 6 says. And it's not that you're bad people, it's just that God is such a standard of righteousness and goodness that everything we do in comparison fails. So if we're going to be authentic, which is the watchword of this culture these days, let's just be authentic here today. Let's just admit it. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's Romans 3.23. All of us have sinned. Let's just, let's just admit it. Okay, I'm owning that. I've sinned and I've come short of God's great glory. See, this missing the mark breaks down relationship with God. We're talking about fellowship with God and sin that keeps us away from God. And we're trying to convince ourselves that we can sin and still hang with God. You know, I'm going to take you back to Genesis chapter 3. By the way, I've said this before, but if you want to understand everything that's going on in the world forever, as long as the world stands, just go Genesis 1, 2, and 3. You'll get it all. That's the whole story. If you understand that, you understand it all. Genesis chapter 3, we go to chapter 3, verse 7 through 10, and we find the very first episode of Naked and Afraid. Did you know that? It's in the Bible. This is, not a, this is not a show somebody made up. This is in the Bible. The very first people were in the first episode of Naked and Afraid. Why? Because they had sinned. Because they ate from the tree that God told them not to, and from that moment, their fellowship was broken. You, know, you want to see signs of broken fellowship? When God comes into the garden, they're hiding because they figured out they're naked. And Adam says, we were afraid and ashamed, so we hid ourselves. And then when God starts questioning, what do they start doing? They start comparing, well, Eve did that. Well, the serpent did that. I think the, the first episode of Naked and Afraid in Genesis 3 is a picture of many of us in here today. We are walking around in the shame and the guilt and the hiding of our sin. And here's the crazy thing. When you're at church, you shouldn't have to. Some of us today, we're so sure that we shouldn't be in this place because we're too guilty. We're filled with shame. We've done some bad things. And we think that when we walk in, our sins are just tattooed on our forehead. We're, we think the ceiling's going to cave in. I want to tell you something. If the ceiling was going to cave in, because sinners walked in, it would have caved in 20 years ago. But it's still standing. There's no reason to hide from God. There's no reason to be in shame before God or to be blamed by God or to fear God. In just a moment, I'm going to tell you why being truthful with ourselves about our sin is the solution to our sin problem. I want you to hear that. Being truthful with ourselves about sin is the solution to our sin problem. You can't hide in the garden forever. Because God's looking for you. There's one more result of lying about sin in verse 10 I want to point out. He says there, if we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar. This is worse. Not only are we lying to ourselves, but when we say we haven't sinned, that turns God into a liar. Because God has claimed that he is light and he is the perfect way. John 3 tells us that he sins, uh, that the judgment is that God sent the light of his son into the world. But the people love darkness rather than the light. So when we lie about our sin, we're just saying, hey, God, we were fine. You didn't need to send your son. We didn't, we didn't have any need of forgiveness. We didn't need a savior. We didn't need somebody to save us from our sins. We were living in the light already. I don't know why you wasted your time sending your son. And if God is a liar, then there's no reason for Jesus to die on the cross for him to come into our presence. John 1, John, you know, who wrote this book first, John, also wrote, wrote the gospel, John, 10 years before probably. And in chapter 1, verses 3 and 4, it says that Jesus made all things, and in Jesus was life, and that life was the light of man. See, here's the whole point of Jesus. God says, hey, y'all living in darkness, we can't be together. 
So I'm going to send my light through Jesus into your world to bring light into your life. And so God's a liar if there's no reason for God to send his son into the world. See, here's the deal. Everyone in this day and age, we're so concerned that we're going to, that all the messages and all the stuff that we hear from the world is going to somehow be a lie and we don't want to offend anybody. But you know what I'm worried about? I'm worried about that we agree with the world and we make God a liar. I don't want to make God a liar. I believe that he is all the stuff that we've talked about today. I believe he is the light. I believe he is perfect. I believe that his ways are right. And so there are two more if we statements that we need to pay attention to. There are two if we's that we can act upon to make us have fellowship with God and to restore this light. By the way, you, you ever ask yourself, why is John writing this? I love John. He's, he's always going, here's why I'm writing. Look in chapter 2, verse 1, right, right below what we just read. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. I'm trying to help you get away from this life into this life. That's why I'm writing to you. And he starts with this, this phrase in verse 7 that I want to dwell on for just a moment. If we walk in the light. If we walk in the light. The word walk there is the Greek word peripateo. It literally means to walk as in a journey, to take a path. You choose this path and you get on it and you keep walking on it. It's a journey word. In fact, and this is way smarter than I actually am, but I want you to know I study and I do my homework when I write sermons, all right? Because I was zoning out in high school during English class. But this word here is in the present tense, which means that it's ongoing. You see, often we think that we take a step towards God and then we're in. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says if we walk in the light, if we journey in the light, if we keep taking steps in the light, if it's ongoing, then we will have fellowship, look at this, fellowship with one another. It's, it's intriguing to me that in the middle of this, this discussion about sin and God being light and us being darkness, that we have this conversation about fellowship with one another. Why is that? But because it's important that we do this thing together. Our partnership with one another begins what we think. By the way, that's what the word fellowship means. It means partnership. Our partnership here as a church means that we begin with what we think about sin. Can I tell you, again, if you're visiting or if you're watching us online today, can I, can I tell you what this fellowship of this church is, what Eastview Christian Church is? It's a fellowship of sinners who have been cleansed. That's what we are. I've said it before, if you come in here thinking you're going to find a bunch of perfect people with perfect marriages and perfect kids and perfect smiles and perfect jobs and perfect, you know, lives, then you've come to the wrong place. Um, if you're watching us on, online, if you're visiting with us today, we want you to understand this is a reality for us. We are a bunch of used-to-bees. That's what 1 Corinthians 6 describes us as. You used to be. So let me tell you about Eastview Christian Church. Used to be a bunch of liars. Selfish, greedy, sexual sins, gossip, swindlers. We used to be angry and mean and use filthy talk. Used to be murderers. Used to be partiers. But here's what he says in 1 Corinthians 6, 11. But that's what you used to be. But now you have been washed. Now you have been sanctified. Now you have been justified in the name of Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. If you want to know our story, this is a fellowship of people who go, yep, we're bad people. We've done a lot of bad things, but we have been cleansed in the name of Jesus Christ and cleaned by him. That's our testimony. And it's a fellowship of not just admitting who we are in sin. It's a fellowship of walking together in the light. See, this ongoing journey of faith was never meant to be walked alone. I want you to hear this again. This journey of faith, this fellowship of walking together was never meant to be taken by yourself. In fact, look in the scripture. Jesus never sends anybody out by themselves. Jesus never says follow to anybody by themselves. They're always in a group. The 12, two, or two, uh, two by two. He's always putting people together. Why is that? Because we need each other to walk towards the light. That's why we tell you all the time, uh, we want you to weekly gather here at Eastview Christian Church or whatever church you're a part of. We want you to come and be in the fellowship. Why is that? Because God gives you more points in heaven? Nope. Because I get more points as a pastor? Nope. Because your crown's going to be bigger? No. Because you're more righteous if you come four Sundays in a row? No. None of that's true. We need you to be here because we're walking together. 
Because we need to know that you're walking and pursuing the light just like I'm walking and pursuing the light. And we're in this walk together, and we need your presence. And I just want to make this, this commitment because you guys have heard me say for the last six months, if you're watching this online, and, I, and, and you might think, well, how many people? 12, 30? We've been averaging over 500 people watching online in the last four months. All right? They watch this service. That's locally. We have three or 400 who watch around the country. Uh, but here's what I want to say to those of you watching online. We want you to come here not because it's not fun to wear your pajamas and watch a sermon, okay? But because we need you here to walk with us. We want to walk together. We need your strength. Why do I ask you to be in small groups all the time? I ask you to be in small groups because participating with one another in intimate relationships, doing barbecues together and laughing together and crying together and praying together and studying God's word together, it helps us walk in the light. If you're here today and you go, man, I feel lonely, I feel like sins are overtaking me, and you're not in a small group, I'm just telling you, get in a small group. They'll help you. We'll walk together through this. And then finally, Christian friendships. So, so many of you have tapped into older people in this congregation, and you should. Remember, we've got five generations in this church. And if you're in a younger generation, I've said it before, just go up to an old person and say, hey, I want to learn from you. Buy me breakfast and make them pay. Okay? <laughs> they should. They should do it. Okay? And just learn from them. And I'm telling you, probably 95% of the people in here that are over 50 would go, okay. They'd do it. So get into a relationship where you can share and you can, you can help each other and you can challenge each other and sharpen each other. Because if you hang out with people who haven't dealt with their sin, you will deceive yourself into thinking you're okay. But if you hang out with people who admit that they're a fellowship of the sinners who have been cleansed, you'll constantly be reminded of the, this light-following path that you're on. That's what he's calling us to. And that's the fellowship that, with God that we're talking about. Remember, God is light. And we fellowship with one another. We say, okay, we're sinners, but we're constantly moving this way. See, there's no way for us to hang over here and sin and just think that we're going to get closer to God who's light. It's impossible. So we say this all the time. This ongoing journey is simply us together taking the next step of faith. We, I'm not asking you to jump from sin, darkness, into light, perfection. I'm asking you to take a direction to move together towards God, to move away from sin. I was thinking this week in the scriptures of how I could illustrate this, and, and it's perfectly clear to me, this word that's used cleansed in here a couple of times. It's a word that was used in the first century for lepers who had been healed. So imagine this dread skin disease, and all of a sudden you're healed and it's gone. Your, your skin is normal. And the first thing you do is you go back to the priest, and, you, and the priest says, okay, you're clean. You can come into the church now. You can be in small groups now. You can hang out with the congregation now. You can go back to your family now. You can be in the marketplace now. You know, you know what would be just really, really dumb for that leper to do? To go back to the leper colony where all the disease and all the stuff that's bad about his life still is. But you know what? That's a picture of how we sometimes live our Christian lives. We've been delivered and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ from our sins, and we want to go hang out in the leper colony. And he's going, let's leave the leper colony. Let's go on to good things. Now, I want to tell you how we have this fellowship with God. There's only one reason that we can have this fellowship with God and one another. It's because God wants to have fellowship with us. Here, here's what I want you to hear if you're visiting especially. God wants to be your friend. That's why he moved through Jesus Christ to do what he did. What is the problem? Sin. What did God do about it? 1 John 4.10, in this is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and he sent his son to be a propitiation for our sins. The propitiation word simply means to atone for, to take it away. 1 John 2.1, just, just down a few verses from what we read here this morning. He says, if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's the propitiation for our sins, not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. Let me just, amen, right? Yeah, woohoo is right. That's an amen. That's a modern amen. Here's the deal. There's one reason that you and I can have fellowship with God, and it's by the cross of Jesus Christ and his sacrifice and what he did to save us from our sins. And so what are we supposed to do with that? This is one of those times where I've been talking to you for 30 minutes, although it's been so fun it seems like only 10. Uh, I've been talking to you for 30 minutes, and I've said all that I've said to come to what I want to say right now. It's 1 John 1, 9. 
I don't have to read it again because I've memorized it because I've quoted it to thousands of people as I've prayed over them making decisions for Jesus. A lot of rededications. A lot of first time come to Christ. And here's what it says. If we confess our sins. That's the key. That's what we're supposed to do. That word we said last week, the word confession, homo logeo, homo, the same logeo word, to say the same thing. Who are we saying the same thing is? The same thing as God. Hey, this stuff that I told you not to do, that's wrong. It's sin. We confess, God. We say the same thing as you. We're telling you, God, that we are not perfect. We are sinful. And you might be going, I don't want to confess because maybe, maybe you came uh, from a church experience where you confessed something to somebody and they judged you and they kicked you out and they don't like you anymore. Or maybe you confessed to somebody one time and they told everybody. Or maybe you've, you've confessed in some church and you've been burnt and you've been abused. And I understand that. But listen, here's why we confess to God. Because he is faithful and he is just. He will be himself. He's not going to do anything with your sin confession other than forgive you and help you walk. He's not going to, you know, he's not going to do anything wrong to you. He's going to do the right thing because he's faithful and just. I, I want to challenge us, church. I think this is something, is a discipline that we're really not very good at, that I'm not very good at. That's confession. We, we need to get better at saying, yeah, that's a sin and I'm sorry. We need to get better at owning it really quickly. This week, here's your challenge. Name your sins. Just name them. Don't do what I do sometimes in my prayer journal. God, forgive me for all the bad stuff I do. God, forgive me if I mess this up. No, just sit down and just write them or talk to God and say, God, here's my sin. Confess it to him. He knows it anyway. If you want to go even deeper, a spiritual challenge may be James 5 where the challenge is to tell someone else, confess your sins to one another. Tell a spouse. Your spouse probably already knows anyway too. Tell a friend, tell a mentor, tell your small group. Let them know that you really are struggling with sins. Guys, listen, we're in a fellowship. It's not surprising. If you come to me and say, hey, guess what, man? I, I got to tell you something that's going to, I get this all the time. It's bad. I'm going to tell you something. You're, you're not going to believe it. And I'm like, you're a sinner? You did something wrong? I believe that because I believe that in me. And I just think we need to get better at confessing. That's what he says. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. The Greek word literally means to send our sins away. me. It's pointing to the sacrifice. Remember the scapegoat in the Old Testament? They would lay the hands and confess the sins on the scapegoat, and they would send the scapegoat into the desert. Jesus wants to send your sins away. Why would you hold on to him? And he wants to cleanse you. He wants to purify you, remove all the stains and the sins from your life so that you can live a holy life. You can have fellowship with the Father and fellowship with his church. Guys, and it comes down to this one thing. Every one of us here can walk away clean today if we do one thing, if we confess our sins. Let's get good at it. Let's own it. Let's, let's be honest see, I, 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 you know this. As I read the scripture, I kind of imagine my way through stories in scripture. And as I'm preparing this this week and I'm talking about Adam and Eve in the garden hiding in their shame and their sin and their blaming of other people, I just wondered in my mind, that, and we can't know, I just wondered in my mind, what would have happened if Adam would have just stepped up and said, hey, God, man, we blew it. We're sorry. Forgive us. We don't know. Because he just went hiding and blaming. I don't know what would have happened if he would have said he was sorry and confessed his sins, but I know what God does now. Actually, God does for us what he did for Adam and Eve. You read the rest of the story. He made them unnaked by making them clothes. Handmade clothes of God, clothing them and uh, becoming their God again. The scripture says that 
Those of us who have confessed and been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. We confess because God wants to make us new clothes so we can be in fellowship with him. So let's get good at confessing, church, so that we can not lie to ourselves and not lie to God. Would you stand with me and let me pray for us as we leave today? God, here it is. Here we are. We confess. We're not perfect people. We sin. We miss the mark. Would you forgive us? Would you cleanse us? Restore our fellowship with each other and with you as we walk towards the light. God, I pray that today will be another step towards the light. We dedicate ourselves to you. We want to serve you, God. We go in the powerful name of Jesus and the power of your spirit living in us. Thank you for forgiving us. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.